Um, so I, I was thinking, what would be the most useful thing for me to, to talk about? Um, and, and I thought it made a lot of sense, really, of just the different beetles that I generally see as I'm wandering around the Pembrokeshire Coast Path and then the ones that people get them confused with. So that's what we often, I would say, get asked most um, is kind of, you know, what is this beetle? And uh, and, and then, you know, what, what else can I mistake it for? So that's what I've done here is it is about the scarab beetles, but then I've also gone through other beetles that that you may get them confused with. So if you're wandering on the coast path and want to say, oh, you know, it's a it's a bright green beetle, um, then what are your what are your options? So I've done it in a really non-technical way based upon their colour. So if you see a brown black beetle that you can kind of have a rough idea what it what it could be. So I hope that's useful. Um, I'm not going to go through too much uh, about the kind of the overview of why the Coast Path is such an important site because that's been done wonderfully already. Um, but I think this is a stark picture to show that this is our issue. You know, we, we've we, we've what you know we we see our habitat here on, on you know especially in Pembrokeshire as a lovely mosaic of green fields but those green fields aren't ecologically green they're not environmentally green because a lot of them are deserts for wildlife they're monocultures they're just one species often of grass of an improved agricultural grass like ryegrass um which are deserts for our wildlife and, and as we say you know that's why you know we're in the middle of a biodiversity mass extinction um and a climate crisis and yet we're not doing anything about it. So I think now's the time that we can get out there and infuse people, especially when they're on the coast path, by saying, you know, you could have similar habitat in your gardens, you know, petition the council, petition the, you know, the politicians to say that we need flower rich habitat um, and it needs to be supported, not just at the fringes um, of, of our society and of our habitats. So, you know, this is the kind of habitat that we get on the coast um, compared to these in, yeah it improved fields in land and you can really see with this aerial shot just how distinct that is and how our farmland is encroaching onto our wildlife habitats and they just cling on where we physically can't farm we need to bring the wildlife back uh, into the rest of our um, our areas so going on because I'm going to be really good and stick to 15 minutes so I'm going to finish at 25 past um, shout at me Alec um, a couple of minutes beforehand if I don't um, so when we're wandering around what's the best thing we can do to make people care um and i guess the best thing is to be excited ourselves by what we see we don't have to be experts and i think it's great you know that we don't all say this is definitely that and then someone comes back and go actually i don't think it is it's a matter of you know i think it's it's something like um this particular species and this is a random fact I have that explains why they're so awesome. Um, I think that's what we find helps is, is find a species that you see regularly, you get excited about it, you have a cool fact and then you move on. So if you're going to see, I guess the most likely thing you'll see on the coast path is a big black bumbling beetle pottering along. Um, we probably get about 200, 300 people each year saying, oh my gosh, I've seen a dung beetle on the coast path. Um, and 99% of the time, it's not a dung beetle, it's a bloody nose beetle. So I'd say that's the first bit. To, so it's you're generally going to be seeing bloody nose beetles out and about. So what is a scarab beetle, first of all? So the scarab beetles are our dung beetles and our chafers. And you can tell them apart really easily by their antennae. So they've got this fan on the end of their antennae um, and it's like a little clump. And then it's really sweet, actually, because if they get disturbed, they pull their antennae in, tuck them under their head and then one pops out and then the other does. And then they like spread the fang, uh, the fans on their antennae. So these little kind of like kind of I don't know what you call them, uh, but yeah, little fans at the end of the antennae. Um, and then if they can fly, they'll open their wing cases and fly off. Um, so again, it's slight anthropomorphizing them to call them cute, but it really helps. So um, other beetles like the bloody nose beetles don't have these fanned antennae like all our scarabs do. So all of these species here on, on this slide are uh, dung beetles. Um, so these are in the kind of door beetle, D-O-R beetle group of dung beetles. Um, you'll see different species. You will see them on the coast path um, and you'll see them next to any piles of livestock dung um, or rabbit dung as well. 
So the one on the left is it's really unhelpful, doesn't have a common name. Um, it's um, I suppose, yeah, it's called Anaplotrupi stercorosus. Um, so this is when you're likely to see wandering around. It's quite metallic, actually, all over um, and has these sort of fine lines going down its wing cases. Um, it doesn't fly. It's well, no, it, it, it can open its wing cases, but it doesn't generally fly. Um, so that one will uh, be around in early summer. The one in the middle here, you can't really mistake for many other things. Um, so that's the minotaur beetle. Um, and the minotaur beetle uh, quite often feeds on rabbit poo. So we don't have any dung beetles in the UK that form dung into balls and then roll those balls and bury them underground. But the minotaur beetle kind of cheats. So rabbit poo, deer poo is kind of almost round. Um, so it'll use its front legs to, to push dung around um, and to roll it away from its competition and then bury it deep underground. Um, and so the males have these fantastic horns on their pronotum. Um, you have minor males and major males, and the major males have really big horns, and the minor ones are sneaky and pretend to be females so that they can sneak up on the females and mate with them without the major males noticing them, because uh, the minor males are generally smaller. Um, and then the females only have a couple of little bumps here. Uh, they don't have these fantastic horns. Uh, and these guys can dig burrows up to about two metres deep in hard soil. And um, so properly strong, some of the strongest animals on the planet dung beetles are relative to their size. And then the one on the right is actually much bigger in, in real life, uh, not bigger than the picture, bigger than the other ones. Um, and we've got two species that look really similar. They just generally come out at different times of the year. Um, and if you see a big black bumbling flying beetle, it's likely to be one of these, uh, one of these door beetles. So you get um, Geotrupes spinager and um, Geotrupes stercorarius, uh, but just call it a door beetle um, and then you're safe. And they've got great metallic undersides as well. Um, and you can identify them by the characters on their legs and on their undersides too. Right. And um, so this is again one of the ones you're most likely to see. You get loads of these on Ramsey Island. So if you're doing um, anything on Ramsey Island or on the coast paths around that area, this is the Anaplotrupi stercorosus, which is the, the one that's quite metallic, um, which doesn't fly particularly well. But you'll see the kind of metallic edges particularly to this beetle. Um, and then this is another real rarity, actually, um, Trichopris vernalis. So this is another dung beetle that's like, it's a another type of door beetle. It's metallic green ish all over top and underneath but mostly on top so you the other ones aren't metallic all over this is another flightless one and doesn't have any lines any stride down its its wing cases here as well so those are your kind of big bumbling dung beetles that you're likely to see um okay what do they do if you're trying to infuse people about dung beetles are awesome well obviously they they stop the world being covered in dung but they do a whole load of other things for us um and for the environment more more widely and you can say you know they bury dung they can improve water quality um they can help farmers farm more sustainably uh, one big issue is that they are um they're really kind of knocked out um, by pesticides, particularly things we use to worm our animals. So that's another reason for, for collecting dog poo um, for when you're out walking is dog poo is generally full of wormers because we worm our dogs generally really regularly um, and that will be toxic to our dung beetles. Um, so we need to be really careful of that as well as in farmed animals as well. So a cool fact is that dung beetles can save the UK cattle industry about £367 million a year by what they do. Um, and so that's quite a nice one to, to remember. I'm going to whiz, actually. I'm not going to spend too long. So that's probably what I would say if anyone said, why are dung beetles important? Why should I care? Um, and I hate the fact that you have to put a monetary value on it. But people do sit up and take notice when you do. And we're working with Welsh Government at the moment now um, to, to actually make sure that dung beetles are included in new agricultural policy decisions. Um, so another beetle, um, another scarab beetle that you uh, you may get confused possibly. So another big bumbling one. This is a, a totally forgotten trogid. Trogid, it's a trogid beetle. Um, and these ones have solid exoskeletons. So they're really, really strong and they're much more kind of greyish in colour um, and they pull their little legs in and hide and they almost just look like a pebble um, if you see them and very matte as well because they're, they're covered in these, these hairs. So I won't talk any more about bloody nose beetles or why they're awesome um, other than to say how they get confused with dung beetles. So 
you can tell it's a bloody nose beetle and not a dung beetle by their antennae. So you can see they've got very different antennae. They don't have the fans on the end like a, a dung beetle or any other scarab beetle has. And they've got very, very smooth wing cases. So none of these lines down their wing cases as well. And they've got very fat feet, um, especially the males, because they, they've got hairs on the bottom that they use electrostatic forces to rip them onto the females when they mate. Um, so, so that's kind of how you can tell a male bloody nose beetle as well, because it's got fat front feet to hold the female. Um, and then again, probably you've already um, seen these in previous talks, but these are the bloody nose beetle larvae. So again, they look like little, basically, so if someone comes and says, I've seen a miniature alien on the coast path and it's metallic green, you know it's a larva of, um, um, of a bloody nose beetle. And they've got little red ends as well where the kind of back of their body sticks out. So everyone gets very confused. They look like they're bleeding out of their bums as well. There we go, you can see it better in, in that shot. So that's what those will be. They'll be out feeding on bed straws and goose grass as well. The other thing you may get confused with uh, is, let me see if this works. Yep. These are um, called Chrysalina banksy um, and they're a type of leaf beetle. Again, very different antennae. They feed um, a lot on plantains. So ribwort plantain, they love and they come out in fairly large numbers. They're really metallic with bright, well, not bright, orangey, browny red legs. I'll just play that one again. Um, really cool and they tuck their little legs in as well when they get they feel threatened too and then kind of pop them out again um a friend of mine just remembers them as banksy beetles um and then that's the way to kind of remember remember the name oh i'm gonna try and leave that slide okay let me just check where we are time wise wow <laughs> it's gonna go quickly okay so the other um other big black beetles you may see are ground beetles and they're generally long-legged beetles uh, that are running really fast across the coast uh, coastal path so they'll be hunt a lot of them will be hunting and so you should see a lot of those legging it around violet ground beetles uh, as well as the black clock beetle um, these ones as well are ground beetles and we've got some nice rarities uh, on the coast path here and then you've got the teeny tiny black beetles on flowers. Um, so the, you'll get quite often, um, you'll see pollen beetles here on open flowers, especially on the coast path on things like thrift, lots of little black pollen beetles feeding on the pollen. Um, and then you also get small black dung beetles like Aphodius ata here um, in, the, in the dung as well. Keep an eye out for these guys. Um, this is a summer chafer. Um, and there's a real rarity called Amphimalonocraceus, which looks really, really similar. Um, but you generally only find it flying on the coast path in kind of hot, sunny days in the middle of the day. So if you see a brown, hairy beetle like this, it is a scarab beetle flying midday on a sunny day. Um, make sure you take a photograph, top and bottom, ideally, um, but definitely one from top down uh, and record it because it may be the rarity which has been found um, on the mainland and on Ramsey Island uh, here as well. And then there's the brown chafer. You can see these cool antennae here as well. Um, and, and this chafer isn't so hairy. So this is another scarab beetle. And I'm not going to go through all the other beetles that we could get them confused with because we've talked about these already. Um, sulfur beetles, though, do look out for them on thrift. I've seen them a lot, um, as well as on bladder campion. Um, these fantastic yellow beetles, almost a centimetre long. Really, really pretty. Um, let's carry on. OK. So metallic green beetles, the main one you'll, I suppose, well, one of the ones you're likely to see is the rose chafer. And it, I mean, you can't not be infused by this beetle. Um, so this is again, it's a scarab beetle feeding on, on flowers. So look, basically, if you go in, if you're trying to infuse people about insects, just look on open flowers. Um, that's where you want to be looking and that's where they generally will be. And these guys fly around as well. And they look like metallic green bumblebees and sound like metallic green bumblebees as they're flying. So they're really nice, big, solid beetles. And again, these are other metallic beetles. You may see we've already talked about these. I think Vicky spoke about these are thick legged flower beetles. The males have the thick legs, the females don't. Um, they're really cool as well. And then tiger beetles as well. Um, but if they were human sized, they'd be able to run faster than the speed of sound. Um, so that's always quite a, a cool one. And they run so fast, they go blind. So that's why you see them stopping and starting because they run, they can't see, and then they have to stop and reorient themselves and then start running again. Um, so that's why they kind of dash around um, on basically on, on the hunt. And dock beetles. So these are fantastic little metallic green beetles as well that feed on docks. So help us to control docks, which a lot of farmers will see as, as weeds, um, but are fantastic plants for wildlife. Um, 
And then very quickly, if you were to see a yellow and orange or yellow or orange and black striped beetle, we get bee beetles around here. This is a type of scarab beetle. They're super cool, mimic bees. We also get wasp beetles, not scarab beetles. Um, but these ones, they even buzz around and move like in a sort of juddery motion like a wasp as well. And then let me just double check the time. I've got about a minute. <laughs> um, so if you see another type of um, beetle that's got like a metallic green head and thorax and an orangey brownish body, you see how scientific I went with this, um, then you get a load of kind of different types of, of chafers as you get garden chafers um, and you can also get some dung beetles. We do get some of these species around here. Um, these are ones that actually tunnel under dung. The middle one's one of my favourite dung beetles ever. I love, I absolutely love them. The one on the left is um, Ontophagus similis. Um, on the Vegas Cenobita, wow, I haven't done dung, dung beetle identification for a while, is the middle one. I should know that as it's one of my favourites, but it's a really pretty dung beetle. Um, and if you disturb it, it like has a panic and like burrows back down underground really quickly. Um, and it's really cute. And then these ones with reddish orange wing cases and black head and pronotum you often see um, flying around as well. Um, but we can, again, get them confused with different leaf beetles. Um, and then if you see big brown beetles, uh, you're likely to be seeing, this is a Aphodius rupertes on the left, so that's a scarab, and um, that's a dung beetle, and uh, that flies towards light, you get lots of them flying towards light at night time in the summer. Um, the middle beetle is a click beetle, not a scarab, um, and if you haven't done that already, it's a great way to infuse people, is you put these kind of bullet shaped beetles on your hand upside down, um, and they flip their thorax and their, um, their, their abdomen um, in a way to flip themselves over with a giant click, hence the name click beetle. Um, and then of course there's the cockchafer beetle, which is a scarab beetle, which is your really big brown bumbling thing that, that flies into your windows in, uh, in kind of early summer. You'll also see these long beetles um, as well on the coast path. You'll see devil's coach horse beetles. These are all types of rove beetles. So any long beetle that's got its body poking out behind its wing cases um, is a rove beetle. And um, the folding of their wings, so they fold wings under these little wing cases. Um, and it, it's such an efficient way of folding that I think um, humans have copied it to um, fold, um, I think, solar panels um, to take out space. So super cool beetles. I'm not going to talk about ladybirds. Um, go to the UK Ladybird Survey website, download their identification key. Um, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, I mainly see the usual suspects, the 24 spot ladybird and the seven spot ladybird out and about when I'm wandering around. And so to, to finish up, just what everybody else has said, um, all of our sightings can really help because everything that we record and we know is there will put more pressure on governments, put more pressure on um, local authorities to actually look after what's there. And we can all use that uh, as evidence to say we need to protect these habitats. So take photographs top down, ideally. That's the best kind of photograph you can get, um, but as many different angles as you can and record your sightings, as Liam said as well. Um, and then the idea is, is to promote people to do things at home. So create wildflower rich habitat, get involved in the St David's Pollinator Trail, give us a shout about that. Um, we're going to do a marsh fritillary um, training day for recording uh, marsh fritillary uh, butterflies, but also monitoring habitat quality as part of a project we're doing here at the Bug Farm to um, create a core habitat for the marsh fritillary population. So drop me an email um, if you would be interested in doing that. I think it's going to be the 6th or 7th of next month. Right, I'm going to whiz through all other things you can do at home. Thank you very much, Sarah.